the problems that Facebook has, most people don't have necessarily. (laughs) And so Redwood is maybe not trying to be Facebook. It's trying to be the rest of us. And I think that's okay. Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Rollbar. Move fast and fix things. Resolve errors and minutes and deploy with confidence. Head to Rollbar.com slash Changelog. Request a demo. Get started today. It's loved by developers, trusted by enterprises, and most of all, we use it here at Changelog. Move fast and fix things with Rollbar. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. Welcome to JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. If this is your first listen, be sure to subscribe at changelog.com slash jsparty or wherever you get your podcasts. Our next episode is all about working from home, a topic that is on our minds here at Changelog and likely relevant to you as well. Suze, K-Ball, Nick, and myself discuss how to optimize your location, your schedule, your communications, and the rest of your life during these stressful times. But that's next week. Right now, we've got Tom Preston Warner. Enjoy. Hello, party people. Jared here. We have a doozy of an episode for you this week. Let me introduce my co-host first. Divya is here. Hi, Divya. Hey, hey. You excited? You ready to go? Yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. And K-Ball's here. What's up, K-Ball? Hello. I am super excited. How many caffeines do you have in you right now? Um, <laughs> Three cups, maybe four. You're, you're three, three cups deep. I was actually thinking about that. As I was thinking about Ruby on Rails this morning, as I was reading, preparing for this show, I thought Ruby on Rails is cool, but you know what else is cool is K-Ball on coffee. <laughs> There's a framework for you. There we, I should create a framework and call it that. There you go. It's definitely a setup for a very good JS party as you're always caffeinated. We have a very special guest today, Tom Preston Warner. Now, for those of you who are not aware of who Tom is, he has a very long history in the software world, uh, a co-founder of GitHub. He spearheaded the blogging like a hacker movement back in 2008 with his blog post and, of course, with Jekyll. He authored semantic versioning. Whether you love it or hate it, that's a thing. Tommel, which is a configuration uh, style used in Rust in the Go communities. And now he's back with Redwood JS, which is an opinionated full stack web app framework for the Jamstack. Tom, thanks for coming on JS Party. Thanks for having me. Very happy to be here. Very happy to have you. So, Redwood, you are here with, like I said, an opinionated full stack web app framework. And you're here for the Jamstack and you brought a bunch of software. So, tell us about Redwood. The first thing we want to know really is the why behind it, because uh, that's what everybody would like to know. Why is Redwood a thing? You don't make too many open source projects anymore, but you're here with the big one. Why did you build this? Yeah, I guess it comes out of frustration with the existing options in the world. And really, it's, it's not that there's a lack of options. It's almost that there's too many options. But what I see is a lack of integration. So in the JavaScript and the Node community, we all are aware that you have no lack of choice when it comes to packages to accomplish things. There's millions of ways to do everything. And when I started getting into that world a couple of years ago, we were building our current startup called Chatterbug, which is a language, a foreign language learning platform. You should check it out, chatterbug.com. We were building it with Ruby on Rails and doing it in a fairly standard way. And uh, eventually we started building front end things in React. And so I started learning React and really loved what I saw there. But along with React comes choices. Because it's not just, hey, I'm going to build a React site, right? Especially if you're building it on top of some, you know, some random backend that's in a different language like Rails or something else. Now you have to make other choices. How do you do CSS? How do you put your files on disk? Like, what do I use for state management? How do I talk to my backend in in the Rails world, right? You could just deliver JSON or you could, you can embed bits of React all over the place. So we went down a lot of these roads and eventually came up with some patterns 
that we really liked. We were like, hey, what if we put things on disk in this way? And what if we put, you know, we chose styled components. What if we did it in this way uh, in the file and we put everything in the file and then we, we named the directories after the files so that they were easy to, to locate and that the file names were the names of the components so that they showed up correctly in your text editor in the, in the tabs instead of all just being index.js that you could actually tell them apart. And so we just collected all these different patterns together and created what we really liked. But the one problem with this was that we still had Rails as a backend and it didn't feel right. It just was like, wow, I have all this amazing power on the front end with React and friends and we've integrated them really nicely, but we still have to, to do things the Rails way on the backend. And what I really want to do is be able to use GraphQL to pull data from each sort of subcomponent of the page and have each component be responsible for its own data function, essentially. And so that means, okay, well, let's implement GraphQL on top of Rails, which we do for our mobile client already. But now we have two problems. Now we have a Rails backend and we have a GraphQL backend. And they're both in Rails, right? We use the, the Ruby GraphQL library, which is quite good, to be fair. It's quite excellent. It's well-written. But now we have front end, two different front ends talking to the back end in two different ways. And so Peter and I at the time, Peter Pistorius, who we started this together like more than a year ago, started thinking about these ideas. And, and this also bumps into Netlify and, and the Jamstack deployment methodology. So there's really two, two things that come together. But let me keep going with the React side. We just started thinking, what would this look like if it was all in JavaScript? If it was JavaScript all the way from the front end to the back end? And you were using some of the great libraries for doing GraphQL on the API. And, oh, actually, that would allow you to have a fully JavaScript client that you could deploy via CDN, via something like deploying to Netlify. That's written in React and friends. And then what if you could deploy your business logic as a GraphQL API into Lambda functions? Netlify makes that easy, too. And then the, the question then really becomes, what do you do for the database? And we can, we can spend some time talking about the database. But we just started thinking about the stack. So the React patterns that we had been developing that we really liked, a lot of things that, that we really loved about how we were doing it, and then combining it with a backend that could scale in, this new, in a Jamstack deployment style. And of course, I love the Jamstack. Uh, I've, you know, I've been talking to the Netlify guys about this since they first started the company. And I'm on the board now, so I've, I've sort of come like all the way around. So obviously, I'm a fan of Netlify. And then, how could you wrap that all up in a single package and make it work? So that's kind of the that's where it comes from. Awesome. I'd love to dig in a little bit there, if you can. Um, Please, let's. So one of the things that stood out to me from that is the comparison to Rails, and I think mm -hmm. you know, looking through the code, there were a lot of things that were very similar in approach. Um, and I want to sort of dive on one particular area of that, which is th it feels like the JavaScript world has been rediscovering the value of convention and the value of not having to configure everything and not having to do things. And there have been tiptoes in that direction by other stacks as well, like things like Create React App or things like um, Vue is a little bit more out of the box and has the Vue CLI and things like that. Or you've got Gatsby doing a set of conventions. So I'm curious, which conventions did you end up deciding to take from the React world or, or other things going on in the front end? And which ones did you sort of bring in from the Rails world? And how did you make those decisions? Yeah, we're, we're obviously inspired by Rails. I've been writing Rails since 2004, maybe. I don't know, I think it was 011 or 010 of Rails. So a long time I've been in the Rails world. And don't get me wrong, Rails changed my life. I'm only here. I've only been able to do what I've been able to do in this world because of Rails. But I also have my frustrations with Rails, like, like anything in the world. There's positives and negatives. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, it changed everything about web development at the time because it was a single integrated thing where we were all, I mean, I was at the time writing PHP. And I was sort of like building my own crappy PHP framework, like I think kind of everyone was at the time. Mm -hmm. And then Rails pops up and it's like, 
what if you could just do all this stuff together and the framework was done for you and you don't have to worry about SQL injections and, 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 and all this stuff. It was all just there. And here's this new language, Ruby, that is way better than PHP at the time. You know, holy wars about languages and which ones are better. But at the time, to me, it was this breath of fresh air. And part of that magic was the opinionation, the convention over configuration, where I've written my fair share of XML configuration files and, and coming to something that's like, just this is probably what you want. And if you want to change it, you can change it. But let's have sane defaults. And so for Redwood, we take the same philosophy, which is this is probably what you want. But if you want to change it, you can. And because Redwood really is comprised of, of mostly existing things in the JavaScript and TypeScript space, you, you maintain that ability to swap things out if you want to. But if you just want to build a simple web app, just you have an idea in your mind and you want to turn it into reality, right now it feels like the burden is too high. And I think especially for new JavaScript developers, people new to React, learning React is not trivial. The power it gives you is immense, but it's not trivial. And then you're like, oh, and there's also this thing called GraphQL, and that's the whole universe, and, and you need to learn that as well. And so when you have these things that are new technologies for a lot of people, in order to use them effectively and unlock the power that is inherent in these new technologies, I think you need something really well integrated, very opinionated to get you there. So I guess, for example, right now, we use Prisma 2, Prisma 2 as a, as a backend. They don't call it an ORM. It's a mm -hmm. query builder, sort of a, yep. a very capable query builder. It's not, it's not mapping you to objects that, that do things. It's just giving you data structures at the end. So you still deal with it in a very functional way. But with that, right now, it supports MySQL and Postgres and will in the future support things like Mongo, Fauna, and other things. And so we're opinionated in the way that we really wanted to start with something that supported relational databases. That was super important to me. And part of the philosophy of Redwood is not being too far from people's existing stacks. Because it's, I think, very difficult to come up with a solution that is wildly different in every way and put it into the developer ecosystem and say, hey, I've solved all your problems with the caveat that you now have to learn everything from scratch, right? So you see this with things like dark lang, for instance, which is super interesting. But I think it will be a challenge there to say, you have to learn a new language and it's deployed on our platform and the IDE is different. Like all these things are different and it might be better. It might be, I'm not gonna say objectively better, but it might be like super legitimately better. But the problem is that might not matter. Because how do you take your existing universe of software development and just throw everything away and start over, right? That's super difficult. But we have all of these amazing bits that people are already using, but maybe not as easily or effectively as they could. And so an integrator can come in. That's an opportunity for an integrator to come in and say, I'm just going to pick the, what I think is the best of all of these, and I'm going to wrap them up in a framework, and I'm going to add a bunch of special sauce on top and present this in a way that is opinionated and to where you're not making a lot of choices. And you can just go from idea to implementation without having to choose every technology and then spend hours and hours trying to get them integrated. I mean, the amount of work that we've done just to get Webpack configs to work properly and Babel configs and get it to deploy on Netlify, like these are not, <laughs> these are not trivial things to do. And a lot of this technology is so early that a lot of people haven't done it. Like we are trailblazing here for sure. I mean, we, we're in constant contact with Prisma and Netlify and constantly bugging them with things that are broken. Like nobody's done some of this stuff before. And that's what I love about Redwood is, is making it possible for people and especially novices to get started with powerful technologies and just not have to work. Just like take your idea and make it reality. Just start writing your React components and your database schema. And that's it, right? Yeah. No, you, you touched on something there that I think was an underrated value of the Rails ecosystem, which is that it gave you a way to get started without having to know much, 
have something that worked out of the box and be able to learn about each component independently without having to worry about all the other stuff because it was just going to work in the default mode. Right, right, right. It just, if you take the blessed path, your life will be easy. But if in the future you need to scale your application, then you can do those things. I think my, my favorite summation of how that works is make easy things easy and hard things possible. That's really the philosophy that we're trying to take there, that we're opinionated, but not so much that we'll say, oh, you can never, ever do a certain thing, especially on the storage side. Because every company, once you get big enough, has very specific storage needs. So I don't think we've unlocked this sort of generic compute layer for storage. I think we're getting close with front-end delivery via CDN and Lambda functions for business logic. I think we're almost there. Lambda is much more capable every day. Every day they reduce the restrictions and it's more powerful. You can globally distribute it. The database side, we're not quite there yet. But also part of the gamble with Redwood, and really this is an experiment. You know, I, I, I gave it, you know, when we first started, I was like, yeah, 50-50, this thing like has legs at all. Now with the reaction of the community since the launch, I think, I think there's something here. But it's, it really is experimental and was designed from the very beginning to grow with the capabilities of the technology that underlies it. So that is especially AWS Lambda or Functions as a Service. But it is also databases. And you start seeing some really interesting things like Fauna come out. And Fauna, the distributed capabilities are, are amazing. It's a little challenging to use via FQL so far, but like Prisma is working to try to normalize that a little bit. Like, can you approach it in a more uh, query builder kind of a way and make it approachable? It's again, it's new technology that you have to learn, right? But something like Fauna would be perfect if it was relational. You have other, on the other side, you have things like Yugabyte, which is a, a kind of a newer company that's come out that I love, but is more enterprise side, but can take a relational database and give you global scale, but you're running your machines or they can, they can host a control panel that will help you run your machines right now. I would love for that technology to someday be done in a, a more SaaS style where you could just be like, spin me up a globally distributed database and I'll, I'll just pay for it depending yeah. on, on how big it is. Right. But we're not serverless yet. Doing a serverless database, Fawn is kind of doing it. You can do it with AWS Aurora Serverless, the longest name for a thing ever, right? <laughs> but but it's it's very restricted in in how it works still, and you can be very cheap. But it, you you can do it. You could make a fully serverless Redwood app end to end today, but it's not going to scale the way that you want probably. But the beauty is on the database side, you choose your database provider, you spin it up, you can get whatever performance you need. So Redwood is really opinionated, like you mentioned. It makes a lot of decisions in terms of the database, in terms of the GraphQL layer and all of these. Do you imagine, because if we make the Rails comparison, generally within Rails, people work within that architecture and they don't really break away from a lot of the conventions. But with this, because you're working within, like Jamstack is brought up a lot and you're working within that ecosystem. And part of the Jamstack is this ability to choose. There's so many options with databases. There's so many options with serverless. So do you imagine that within Redwood, people would start with that framework and then break away from the conventions by pulling in their own systems and conventions? So in a sense, ejecting from Redwood, and would that be something that you would recommend or encourage for people using that since it is very unique? My hope is that people never have to eject from Redwood. That it, I, okay. I see it the same way as saying like, would you ever eject from Rails? Like it's not... A question that you would ask. And I know that that's how Create React App is. But Create React App is very unopinionated. It's a very kind of base level of, of what you get, right? If you want anything on top of that very basic thing, you're back to choosing technologies and trying to integrate them. And everyone does it in a different way. And then you're like, ah, I can't do this one thing I really wanted to do. So now I'm going to eject. And now I don't get the benefit of being on top of a, you know, a framework as such. We see Redwood as a proper framework, something that is always with you and that you always want with you because it's providing improvements forever. So I think people will always need to be able to change the parameters a bit in how they deal with a framework. If it's too rigid, then no one will use it because they know that it can't scale, right? That would be killer for a framework. Just people start using it and then they build something and it gets popular and they're like, we had to bail from 
redwood because it it was too inflexible, that's very bad. But it's also, I think, bad for a framework to be too flexible, where you're like, eh, well, you can have any front end, you can use React or Vue or Svelte or whatever you want, you know, and you try to cram everything together, then the question is, like, what is this and why is it helping me? And, and can you really maintain a high level of integration with so many options? And I don't see it happening. It's, it's certainly not our intention for Redwood to be super flexible. We want it to be flexible in the ways that matter. So on the database side, I want it to be very flexible. If at some point you want to CDN deliver your React client, but run your own servers for your GraphQL API and all your business logic, then I think that's fine. And Redwood will be very amenable to that. So that's a level of flexibility where you go away from serverless. You run on the whole thing custom, run it on your own CDN, run it on your own hardware for your business logic to run your GraphQL API, run your own database, however you want. I want it to be able to run in that environment, but it's also important to me that you can just deploy it to Netlify. And it's like, oh, I had this idea, I coded it up, I pushed to Netlify, and it's live. I had to set up my database right now. You know, I think over time that will become easier too. And I've talked with the Netlify folks to hopefully make it easy to spin up simple databases through like Heroku or DigitalOcean or something so that you could do it without having to leave Netlify. We'd just be like, I need a database. And Netlify can be like, cool, we got it. In the same way that they provision Lambda. They could provision or AWS Aurora or something. It's like, give me an Aurora database, Postgres on, you know, this type of performance characteristics. And it's just like, okay, here you go. And if you need to change that later on, you know, that's a hassle. But companies go through that kind of migration all the time where you need to change the capabilities of your storage layer. Two of you at least are insiders for Netlify, so you probably can't say anything. But I would be shocked if Netlify wasn't looking at a marketplace solution like Heroku. I mean, that it's it's a clear development. And so that seems like, I don't know what the timeframes are. That's very complex to deliver, but I am confident that's in the future. Seems like it would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting because whenever you talk about Jamstack solution, and this comes up a lot whenever I talk to people because I work at Netlify on the developer experience team, uh, generally it's like, okay, I, want, I work with the Jamstack. I have something that's pre-rendered, a static application that works. And then the moment the database part comes in, it's like the next hurdle because provisioning it takes a while. And I think we've worked a lot on trying to make that a bit smoother. So I think currently we have within the CLI, you can provision a Fauna database so that it works with Netlify. But again, like we're trying to smooth out the curves of that because there is some, it's essentially moving from Netlify to Fauna. It's, it's a lot of the back and forth. And I think looking at the Redwood docs, there is this mention of like not wanting to do that because the moment you talk about database, you have to like, oh, I have to spin it up somewhere else. And then I have to go to this other dashboard. And now I have two things. I have the Netlify dashboard, which holds my static application and then the database, whatever, if I'm using Firebase or Fauna or whatever that is, I have to go there. And so there's two places. And I think that adds a cognitive burden, right? Because now you're just like, there's two places that things live in which my deployed app needs to function. And so... Yeah, so I think the, the nice thing about Redwood is just the ability for you to have everything all in one. And I think within Netlify as well, we, we think a lot about how to make people be incredibly productive without having to make those like cognitive leaps or move into a separate dashboard to do things that they want to do. Yeah, I agree. And again, I think there's a feature where that process is much simpler, mm -hmm. where you can get a database. I don't know what this looks like at Netlify. It's something that I talk about Basically, every time that I get together with Matt and Chris is what is the future of databases look like on the Jamstack? Because to me, full stack web application development is the next evolution of Jamstack. That, that becomes a primary place that you would deploy a full stack web application. And that's what Redwood is about. I had a tweet a year and a half ago where I said, essentially, I predict that within the next five years, your next full stack web application will be deployed on Netlify. And so Redwood is, is the answer to that. I didn't see anyone else doing it, and I just kept thinking about it. You didn't want to be wrong. What's that? So you didn't want to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, it was like a year was up, a year had gone by, and I'm like, oh, this isn't happening yet. Oh, God. They say the best way to predict the future is to invent it. 
Exactly. Right. And so that's, so that's what we're doing, right? We're saying, well, we have some ideas for how this could work. Let's build it and see if other people have the same problems. And that I think is, is the job of any piece of open source software or any company. Hey friends, got some good news for you. Linode just added a cluster of Linode's S3 compatible object storage to the Frankfurt data center. In celebrating this, they're giving everyone, not just Frankfurt, but everyone three months of free object storage starting today. There's no bill, there's no promo code, there's no redemption process. Sign up, get object stored from Linode, and from March 1st to May 31st, there is no bill, it's too easy. Head to linode.com slash changelog. Tom, I think the framework versus library distinction is one worth emphasizing and maybe talking about a little bit. We talked about how you're trying to create the world that you want to see with Redwood. And so in order to do that, you have to have adoption. And like you said, you weren't really even sure if, if this would be a thing that would be successful. Sounds like people are at least interested. You, you got our interest for sure. I'm also have Ruby roots, grew up, built a career around Rails. And so I was very much pro framework from the moment that Rails solved a bunch of the thousand paper cuts that I was previously solving myself, kind of a la carte on each new project. That being said, historically, the JavaScript community and ecosystem has been anti-framework and more pro libraries, you know, picking and choosing your favorite things and, and putting it all together. And these are kind of things that seem like they're like community based, like Go is very similar, like the Go community is very much micro things. And the Ruby community, the Python communities, they've been more open to frameworks and to building on a framework. So I'd just love for you to, first of all, explain the difference to folks between a framework and maybe a library, and then also just speak to whether or not you think Redwood as a framework will be something that will be a turnoff to JavaScript folks. Yeah, in my mind, a framework is something that you build your application upon. So it's something that's larger. A library is something that you pull in and sort of call as just a, a thing that gets something done for you, right? Um, the framework is always underneath. So it's, you can think of it in layers. Like the framework is underneath, giving you all of these capabilities, feeding your application data, sort of inter maybe interfacing with the, the client. That's how web framework. A library happens once you receive the request and you're doing stuff and now you need a lot to call a library in order to interface with some other thing. So like you want to send a, an automatic tweet or something, I don't know, then that's, that's a library. It's something that you're doing separate from the, the request and response flow, as you will, or, or it's a library to handle encryption or something. Like it's, it's something that is in service of your application, whereas the framework is underlying it and managing the interface between your application code and the customer, essentially. So that's kind of how I think it. So in the JavaScript world, I think the focus has been on libraries because this is how you often see things. When you have either a new language or a new set of technical capabilities, people look at that and they say, there's opportunity here. We can now do things that we weren't able to do before. So I have ideas. Let's explore them. And lots of people start exploring the territory. And that's how it's been in the JavaScript world for the last five years, for sure, and maybe longer. And you see millions of, of approaches to things, and they're all done in libraries because they're all little pieces, and nobody knows what the best way to do things is. Everyone's just experimenting. Everyone's putting ideas out there. But what happens eventually is that people start to feel like there are best practices, that there are winners and losers to those library wars. And then you start to see integration happen. And I think what people are craving right now, and I think you see this in the response that people have had to Redwood, is that people are craving that integration because trying to figure out what the best choices are and then doing your own integration is a huge amount of time. It occupies a lot of time. That's not building your actual valuable thing for your customers. And I think you'll see more of that in the JavaScript world 
because of this, the, the amount of choice that's available, right? It's like, mm-hmm. now you can do things. How do you make it easy to do things? So you don't think this will be a, a major hurdle. There'll probably be other things that hold it back. The what, Redwood? Yeah. From the interest that I've seen so far, I think people are really excited about it. People are excited about something that looks more like Rails in the JavaScript world. Because, it, I mean, people call React a framework. I don't really think of React as a framework. It's one part of a framework. I mean, it is framework-ish, but to me, mm-hmm. it's more, it's just this very specific part of the rendering layer. And you can build an ecosystem of other libraries around it that you can assemble into a framework. But it's it's one of many, right? Like you have Vue as a, as a serious competitor. But to me, React... I mean, I started with React. I honestly don't have a lot of Vue experience, so I'm not going to talk a lot about React versus Vue or anything. I just love what React makes possible. And so what will the challenges for Redwood be? I think it's can we evolve the technology to meet what our vision is quickly enough that people will tolerate it not working as well as we want it to work now just because it's so early and the technology is available to make it fulfill that vision? Can we get vendors to increase the capabilities of their things? One thing that I want that I've always wanted to do with Redwood since we started working on it was to use it as a tool to essentially force vendors to increase the capabilities of their offerings, like Lambda. If we can get Redwood to become popular, then I can go to the Lambda folks and say, people want to use this as their primary GraphQL API because it can be distributed. But the file size limits are too low right now to make this work for really serious applications. And they can say, I see that there is interest in this and we will prioritize working on that. So that's part of it. Part of it is using it as a, as a lever to move providers. And that includes Netlify. So let's dive into Redwood and the opinions that it has and the decisions that it makes for a developer who Yarn installs and creates a Redwood application. So the, there's lots of different things we could talk about, the file structure, the technologies chosen. What's the, the biggest selling points in your eyes? What are you most excited about? Help people understand what Redwood is offering to a developer. I think number one is, is the integration. It is everything works together. All the config files have been refined to such an extent that you just don't have to worry about them. You just get straight into your code. So I think that's number one. I think if the set of technologies that we've chosen is something that you like, then that makes it really easy to say, oh, okay, I'm going to try my next thing in Redwood and see if I can skip all of that work that I used to have to do. I think the next thing is depending on who you are, but one of the main selling points for me is that it's multi-client ready. And by that, I mean, right now, we make it easy for you to build a web application on top of a GraphQL API. And some of the comments that I saw early on when we were first talking about Redwood with people was like, why do you need a GraphQL API? Like, that's so much harder than the way that Rails does it, where you just have your backend talking directly to your front end and you're generating your pages server side. And there's not this additional layer of abstraction in between them that now you have to learn GraphQL and GraphQL has all the problems that come with GraphQL, which are caching and, and managing that and, and making sure people don't abuse it. And, you know, it's, there are challenges there, but the advantage is that if your backend is just a GraphQL API, then you are ready to build as many clients as you need and you never have to duplicate the effort. So like I mentioned before at Chatterbug, we built a whole Rails application, we had a desktop app, and then we're like, all right, time to build the mobile application. And we're going to choose React Native because it's we're already using some React on the front end and we'll get nice reusability of components and that's going to be super sweet. But then we want to use GraphQL because that's a really nice match for React and the way that React thinks about the world. So we're like, okay, now we have to build a GraphQL API. So now we're duplicating the effort that we have in the business logic side. And so now we have the Rails backend that is done in the traditional way and the GraphQL API. Now I have to maintain both of them. And you start to wish that your web front end was just consuming GraphQL. So if that's the case, and I think that will be be a very common case for people developing applications, then why not just start with GraphQL? Yeah, it's a little more overhead to begin with. And there are challenges that we haven't 
solved perfectly. But part of the promise of Redwood that I have for myself is that we make those challenges easier to where you don't have to worry about caching as much. Where you don't, like, we come up with solutions for these. This is the beauty of a framework is that the framework can worry about optimizing the experience and solving problems for you because the number of people using the framework hopefully will be vast. And so that work has really good payoff. Whereas if you're just doing it for yourself, the payoff is much lower. You're like, yeah, I'll solve my problems, but this is super hard. Like, how can we make this as easy as possible? You take shortcuts. It never gets the attention it needs because it's not part of your core product experience. You don't really want to have to do that stuff. So maybe the framework can, can do that for you. So I, I totally hear what you're talking about on the back end because I, I have seen that problem play out. What does this look like on the front end in terms of the clients, in terms of facilitating that experience of multi-client? Are, are we talking about having you know shared layers between web front end and a React Native front end? Are there other things as you talk about you know those other consumers of this API that Redwood can do to facilitate that? Yeah, I think that there's a world in which Redwood is not just the web side and the API side, but that included in Redwood is a mobile side and a CLI side. And that those things are done in the same way that the website is done right now. That, that the same kinds of affordances, the things like cells where we make data fetching declarative and abstract away some of the complexity there, that we can do the same thing for mobile. And we just... We haven't touched that yet, but we have also now a lot of knowledge from Chatterbug React Native mobile app that we can take and say, these are patterns that we've used. We use cells in the Chatterbug uh, mobile application. We use cells. They're, they look very similar. So can we reuse these same patterns and make it even easier to build your client where you're able to reuse components? What does that look like? If they're in the same repository, that's way easier than if you have to extract your components out to a separate library and then constantly be increasing the version or linking them. And like, there's a huge hassle in doing that. But if you have all your sides in the same mono repo, then they could share much more easily. And so I think the benefits that you would get out of that, of having that same kind of tightly integrated way to think about a desktop app or a CLI version or a mobile app, right? We can do one for Electron. We can have a React-based you know, electron desktop app that you could just, just, just like build your React components. That's where it is for me on the front end. I just want people to have, be able to have an idea and just start writing React components that render stuff and fetch data. So one thing you mentioned there that I think would be interesting to dive deeper on is this concept of cells. Because this is a place where you're not just providing a strong set of conventions that have been done in other places, but you're saying this is the golden path, you're introducing a new and very interesting abstraction. So can you kind of lay out what that is and how it works? So cells are an abstraction that makes it possible to do your data fetching in a declarative way. And what it looks like is you have a React component and it exports certain things. One of those things it exports is a query that is just a GraphQL query you also then export a success constant that is a React component that receives the data that is what you get from a successful result of your GraphQL uh, call running. But you also have an export for a failure mode and for a loading state and even for an empty state. If you have a list of things and you want to, to render something different, if it's empty, then you can do that. If you don't have the failure export or the empty export then those things will just end up in success. So you can kind of go as deep as you want in that regard, but you're not writing any imperative code in order to do data fetching. You're just stating, here's my query, here's what happens when there's success, here's what happens when there's failure. And you do it all just by exporting constants that are named the right thing. And then we essentially have a higher order component that takes that information and just wraps it in the imperative bits to make that work properly. The power in doing that is that it allows us to get into the flow of your data fetching and optimize it into the future because we're handling that for you. So one place that we want to go is to solve the waterfall problem. So the waterfall problem is in the style that we're doing it, you have a wrapping component and it maybe does some data fetching. And then nested within that wrapping component, you have subcomponents. 
And those subcomponents do their own data fetching. This to me is, is the dream of React, is that each chunk of your page can be responsible for its own data fetching. That way you're isolating responsibilities. It's way easier to think about your code. The problem with the current way that that happens is your outer query has to complete and provide the data to the component, the success component, before any subcomponents start rendering. And that means that they have to wait in order to do their own data fetching. But you can imagine that because we have this higher order component that handles the logic for you, and because we have a build step that we do, we can get into that flow and start to think about whether we could run those queries at the same time and be able to orchestrate just asking. It's like if you only require the ID, like a user ID, like think of a user profile page where you've got one chunk that, that pulls maybe your profile data, but then another chunk wants to pull the blog posts that you made or some set of activity on the, the website. Those are separate components, but they don't need the profile data to do their work. They only need the user ID. So could you look at those queries and say, well, each of these only needs the user ID, so they're not actually dependent on each other. Could we essentially prefetch that data and have it ready to hand to the subcomponents by the time they were ready to run? And there's also all kinds of stuff coming down in React Suspense that is going to make, I think, a lot of this work easier. But if we could maintain the idea that you have these cells that are just declarative in the way that you run queries, I think it would radically simplify the way that people can can put these sites together. Yeah, that's super interesting. It reminds me a lot of what Relay from Facebook is doing in terms of like trying to aggregate up these queries, uh, but potentially in a more transparent and easier to integrate way because it's built into how you handle cells. Yeah, it's a little bit like Relay in that it's trying to handle this stuff for you. Relay gets kind of complicated. You end up splitting up your queries a lot. Each component is responsible for only the data that it sees. And that's interesting. And I think I can see how that would scale well and that would work at Facebook. But for me as a normal developer, I think in terms of whole GraphQL queries. And I don't want to split them up in such a finely grained way. That's how my brain works, at least at the moment. I think as we try to build bigger sites with this, we'll come up with different challenges and and along the way we'll come up with better solutions for for how that might work. If you have some if you have to make some giant GraphQL query that's not super great, but the problems that Facebook has, most people don't have necessarily. <laughs> yeah. And so Redwood is maybe not trying to be Facebook. It's trying to be the rest of us. And I think that's okay. I wanted to bring the conversation back slightly to the premise of Redwood, which is like full stack for Jamstack. And mainly because, so one of the things that happens when you talk about the Jamstack is there's a lot of like FUD around it and confusion around what Jamstack is. And I think people are always like, there's no, like Jamstack is static and you can't do something full stack. And so with Redwood, you're like, you can do full stack Jamstack. But I think there's a, a fear or like for me, there's a bit of a fear that that adds more confusion around Jamstack because they're like, wait, I thought Jamstack was like static and pre-rendered. So like, why is it full stack? Because I think we always try to make that distinction of like, well, we're moving away from monolithic applications because that's not what Jamstack is. And I think with the moment you bring up full stack <laughs> with Jamstack, I think people are like, wait, but you said no monolith. So like, how does this fit into that schema? And so I'm curious, like how you all at Redwood and you particularly talk about Redwood and how you manage that full stack Jamstack confusion around that. It's a fair question, and we are intentionally pushing the boundaries of what the definition of Jamstack is, I think, a little bit. But I did talk to Chris Bach about this to make sure that it was in line <laughs> with how they, you know. Yeah. Chris is one of the founders of Netlify. And I was like, is Jamstack the right word for Redwood? Because it's, I mean, it is different. It's not pre-rendering. Like, it's about a full no. stack thing. There's a database involved. Mm -hmm. Should I just call it like an edge framework or like an edge ready framework that was one direction that we were thinking about going because it really is about pushing everything to the edge as much as possible and his response was like no this is very this very much is the jam stack it's a re-architecting of the web in such a way that you're able to push your client experience to the edge so that might be pre-rendered pages 
But now we can take the entire client and push the entire client to the edge with things like React. And so you're still delivering static files. That's the, that's the amazing thing to me, that you can create your whole website, your whole client experience, and it's just a statically deliverable set of files via Webpack. And you can put that on CDN. So now you can have those available, right? Whether it's pre-rendered or whether it's the client itself. I think those both qualify as, as the, the J and M in Jamstack. That's JavaScript. It's markup. It's maybe less markup. It's more JavaScript in the Redwood case. But we do want to offer the ability to pre-render on a route by route basis where you can just say, here is a route. You know, if it's, let's say you're building a blog, you know, this is maybe not the best thing to build with Redwood. There's lots of good solutions to this. But for the sake of everyone knows what a blog does and how it works, I'll use a blog as an example. You have a blog and, and maybe your, all your blog files are at slash blog slash some slug. What if you could just on that route say, I want this all pre-rendered and then give it away to know what are the values that you would plug in for that slug? And now it could just go through and iterate all of those values beforehand and pre-render them. This is not new. Other things like Next make this possible. But this is something that I think is super interesting, this hybrid model, where you can say, this is a full stack application, but I have certain parts of it that I want pre-rendered. Yes. And that becomes important now, too, from an SEO perspective. And one of the biggest questions that we get is, how do I do SSR, server-side rendering? And so far, the answer has been, well, we don't, and we really hope to not ever have to, but the solution we have will be pre-rendering. So we want to say, if you really want to make sure that your front page, your marketing pages are fully baked markup, then say that you want them pre-rendered, and we'll do that. And with Netlify, that's super easy. You're just like, hey, here's a bunch of pre-rendered files. If you get a URL that matches one of those, just serve that straight off the CDN. If you don't, then drop back to index.js, and now it's your application experience. The beauty is that you can have that all in one application. In order to get that same characteristic at Chatterbug, we have to use Fastly to stitch together a Netlify-deployed marketing site with a Rails backend, and it's super annoying, right? Now we have separate repositories for all the marketing stuff, and the application, and it's just, it's more friction when it comes to knowing where stuff is and how to change things. Because you have to remember, like, which, is this on the, the statically delivered marketing part of the site, or is this part of the application? And it's not always super clear where the division is. But what if you just had the ability to pre-render your, your marketing pages while still being able to use JavaScript in the normal way to augment that and pull in, in dynamic stuff like we've been doing in the, in, the, in the static site world since forever, right? Since the early days with Discuss, where it's like, okay, you've got a Jekyll site, it's blogs, and here you can just embed a Discuss thing, and this is how you do comments. So you could, you'd still be able to do that. So that, to me, is better than server-side rendering, which I just I want to go away. I think if we could make SSR go away, it makes everything easier from like the whole rehydration process it just yet the way you have to think about things is gnarly. And it's like, I can deliver the whole client directly to the customer and I can do it very fast. And eventually we'll get our deliverable sizes down. Maybe Apollo has some work to do on reducing deliverable size. <laughs> we use Apollo for the GraphQL transport. It's a fair bit of code. So but these, these are all things that we can do, right? Like maybe not everything is, is puppies and rainbows right now, but we got time, right? Let's spend a year or two or five years refining this stuff. And what could Redwood look like in five years? I think it could be pretty awesome. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog thanks to Rollbar. We've been using Rollbar for years and they've never let us down. Just recently, they rolled out a brand new user experience with three major steps forward. First, they've adopted powerful and consistent multi-project views across the entire user workflow. You can get intelligent, real-time alerts on errors across microservices in a single view using their new multi-project filter. Whether you're looking at the main dashboard, the items view, or versions, you'll only see what you care about. 
Next, users now have their own personal workspaces with powerful filters for projects, environments, and frameworks that persist across all views. Finding new errors is also faster and easier with improved time frame and new or reactivated filters. Finally, get insights on data across multiple projects in one go. Run queries and correlate data across services with the multi-project functionality in RQL. Visualize those results and look for trends or anomalies easily with graphs. Check it out and see what you think at rollbar.com slash changelog. Once again, that's rollbar.com slash changelog. Let's talk a little bit about things we can do on the performance side and how we think about pre-compilation. Because you know, one thing we were talking about on the break is the approach to pre-compilation that y'all are taking is kind of the inverse of Gatsby, where it's don't unless you have to, but then you can. But you brought up, you know, really the goal for all of this is performance. What are the outcomes? So what are the things that Redwood is doing today and that you can do in Redwood going forward that'll really maximize performance in this multi-client world? Redwood is optimized for being a web application. So that's different, I think, than most of these other things like Gatsby, which are really quite optimized for content sites, right? blogs, big marketing sites. That's maybe a big difference in how we perceive the world. And so everything is really dynamic from a content perspective. We're not doing pre-rendering, right? Well, we don't do any pre-rendering right now. The goal is, like I said, to be able to do pre-rendering. But what would it mean to pre-render? Like, think of web apps that you've built before. Like, what would you pre-render? Like, a, a lot of apps are, you know, you as a user are interacting with them and doing things. And you might have some pages that could be pre-renderable, maybe even a lot of pages. But what are those pages? And can they really be pre-rendered? Or is it just a lot easier to, to dynamically produce them? And I think if there is pre-renderable content, then it's probably caching. And so I think a big challenge for Redwood in the future is how do you make GraphQL caching a lot, lot easier? Because there are, I, just, I don't see a lot of solutions for that. It tends to be fairly complex. It's not nearly as straightforward as it is with the REST API, but there are solutions there. They're maybe just not fully explored. And if you can cache, if you can do caching well, and you can say, all right, well, this data is going to be requested and if I can cache that, then I can provide pre-rendered content to all of my clients. Because what would it mean to pre-render and deliver content to a website and a mobile application and a desktop application and a CLI? Does that even make sense? Where are the benefits across those use cases? And if you, if you want to do that, you probably have to abstract up a level and put it between your GraphQL and your client. And that looks like caching. How similar to a distributed database does that get us, right? Like if we're thinking about how we distribute data out to the edge or push things out, caching is in many ways like doing that at the read level. Uh, and if you are able to sort of update your caches by write and you're willing to have some amount of period where you're not fully consistent, you could even, you could essentially do that at the write level too. So does that move us in that direction? Are there more things that are missing? I would love for that to be the direction. I would love for you to have read duplicates all over the world, which like you're saying is, I think that's a really smart way to think about it. If we could do that, then you have to think a lot less about caching and maybe caching, more aggressive caching can wait for later. If there's different stages of, of optimizing your performance. When you first start, you fully render everything every time and that's fine. Like you can get away with that and then you get more traffic and you start thinking about, wow, like we're, we're using a lot of Lambda minutes this is not cool. This is getting pretty pricey. So how can we reduce the amount of, of logic that we're running? And if you can put that data closer to the edge and, and have that available, that'll get you performance. It doesn't necessarily reduce your compute time, although getting responses back faster from your database would help. I think there's always going to be a need for additional caching in front of your logic. 
where can you get those benefits, right? And so if you have a request that comes in via GraphQL and it's the same as a request that you had a short time ago, what's the best way to return that same data in, in, within that window? And so there's, there's a bunch of other questions around Redwood and building a competent web application that are, are still unanswered. I think one of them is maybe you want something like Redis. Redis ends up being a pretty important piece of a lot of web architectures today for exactly this kind of use case. And so where's your, if you're running your business logic in Lambda, where's your memcache, right? Putting your memcache halfway across the world is not going to solve anything for you. So now you want to locate your memcache next to your lambdas. And if you really want to distribute your application, which is the dream of Redwood, now you want memcaches close to all your lambdas. So is there a solution for that? Another question is, where do you put background jobs, right? You want to send emails out of band. You could use a, a separate service, but there's lots of things that you'll want to do within your application to run batch jobs, to uh, roll up data into, into single bits of information that you now store back in the database. How do you do that, right? There's bits and pieces that you can assemble out of AWS, but how do you make that Redwood easy? Where's the solution for that? I don't know. Maybe we build some of these things. I, I have no problem building some of these things to make the ecosystem easier and better. I, I don't know that there's solutions that are as good as I want them to be out there for some of these things. But, I, you know, being now working more closely with Netlify on the board, I'm hoping to be able to make some of these things more possible. And there's already some new interesting things that we're working on that I think will make the number of options that you have for doing things like edge caching a lot easier. There's a bunch of them. There's all kinds of stuff that is part of a competent web application setup. Yeah, there's some really interesting direction to, to probe there from the Redwood front. So first off right now, how well do you deal with having multiple backend data stores? Right. If you have a Redis layer and you have a you know, Postgres database and you have, uh, I don't know, maybe you have some things that are living off in some CMS that you just have API access to, like how do you integrate that into a Redwood application? It's totally fine right now. We make it really easy to access your database from your services files. The services files are what your GraphQL API is going to map your resolvers to automatically for you. If you haven't seen that in the tutorial, check it out. It's super slick. In those services files, you just get DB as a variable that you can access without having to do anything. It's just, it's just there. We just insert it for you. We won't do that with anything else, but there's nothing that prevents you from doing this the normal way, where you have some library that represents some third-party service or some other database, and you just you pull it in, you create it. It's a singleton pattern or whatever, and you access it the normal way. So you could have any number of data sources that you want using a traditional set up or you want a third party thing. So let's say you want to send emails directly from your Lambda functions for security reasons, or that's just how you'd like to do it. Then you can set up your, your integration with your mail provider through there. And you just have a library that, that knows how to do it for you. And all the configuration is somewhere else. You don't have to look at it. There's no problems there. You can have any number of data sources that you want. The other thing that was occurring to me as you were speaking, I don't think I've seen anything talking about this yet. So one of the things with having these different distributed data layers is that different types of data have different consistency needs and have different amounts of sort of real-time updatiness. Um, and especially when you're talking about pushing everything out to the edge. Do you have thoughts on how we could make that feel Redwood easy? You know, in terms of <laughs> like, because right now it, when I've dealt with that situation, it's very manual, right? It's like, okay, this needs to go all the way back to the database. And anytime it's updated, you invalidate any caches you have. Whereas this one, it's okay if it takes a while. And this one maybe can't even be cached. Like, how would we make that easy? I don't have a super good answer for you on that one. Come on, it's, Tom. It's not, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Do you know how long it took us to, for the good answers, do you know Tom? how long it took us just to get Redwood 01 out? But don't a, take that as a critique. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad. I always ask the these like nasty questions of you did this cool thing, but how do you make it ten times cooler? Yeah, it's like that's cool and all, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, these are all great questions. These are all you know. It's an open source project, K Ball. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm definitely yes. going to be uh, pulling down the source and taking a look. GitHub. We do accept pull requests. No, I, I would love to make uh, streaming. You know, we'll get streaming in there. We'll get real time data flows in there. It's just a matter of time. You know, we started with the base of what we thought was necessary 
to get a what looks like a pretty standard, normal looking thing going. It turned out we drove a lot of the development of Redwood with the tutorial itself. So the tutorial works a hundred percent because we essentially were like, we're going to write the tutorial in a way that we want it to work. And then we're going to make that actually work. And so it was, it was tutorial driven development. We've started with readme driven development, but then we, we graduated to tutorial driven development evolved. And then the line in the sand for when we wanted to publish this and get a website out and start talking about it a lot was the tutorial works 100%. And so the tutorial worked 100% the day before we launched it. And that was the day it was, it was right down to the wire. So Redwood does not include a lot of things that you're going to want. And that's, that's on purpose because we wanted to get it out there. But we wanted to wait not too long, uh, but we wanted it to be not vaporware. I'm fairly allergic to hype in general when a company or an organization or a project hypes something up way beforehand, before it's available. And they're like, this is going to be amazing. And here's little sneak peeks and look how great this is going to be because it's really dangerous. And I've seen this several times in my life. The more you hype something up, the more you better be able to deliver on that hype. Because if you don't and you under impress, you lose those people forever. They'll never come back. Because you cheated them. You got them excited, and then you let them down. So I much prefer the way that Apple used to be, which was, oh, and one more thing. So let's talk about the company slash organization slash community slash project. So, of course, you're behind this, and we know you have the, the vested interest insofar as you wanted to see this future come to fruition, and so you're helping create it. Also, you have Netlify ties. Who else is involved? Is there like a company behind this? Help people understand you know, what is Redwood, the community look like? There are four core contributors right now. So myself, Peter Pistorius, who is with me at Chatterbug. And, and a lot of these ideas come from us just talking about architecture and our frustrations around Rails and and uh, having a full stack JS thing. And then Rob Cameron, who's been a friend of mine since forever. He was the best man at my wedding 15 years ago. We've been working on stuff since forever. So I, we brought him in and then David Price now is on the team. He's here in San Francisco with me and he's been a huge help in just getting the tutorial together. He's really helping manage the, com the community. And the funny thing is that aside from Peter, really, I can't claim that any of us are super JavaScript experts, Yeah, honestly. And I think that's probably a benefit because especially coming from Rails, the, the tolerance for pain is, is, is quite low. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. And the problem is that once you spend enough time in the JavaScript world, your tolerance for pain goes up <laughs> quite a bit. And I was even in that phase. And Rob came in and we're, you know Peter and I are like, hey, check out how easy we made this. And Rob's like, this is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why do you have to do all this? This, this is so much boilerplate and... Mm -hmm. There's so much truth in that statement. Like the tolerance for pain in the JavaScript ecosystem is 100% holding us back. Yeah. So the beginner mindset has always served me well. And that is, if you don't know how things work and you come in and you have to figure them out, you'll see things that other people don't see. And so I sometimes say this in jest, but ignorance is my superpower. Not knowing what can't be done sometimes allows you to do the thing that nobody else will do because it's obvious that you can't do it. And so that's a, that's a bit of our philosophy. I mean, that's my, I, don't really, I can't learn everything, but I love building stuff and I try to be aware enough of alternatives that I don't, that I'm not just duplicating what other people have done. And then I'm like, Hey, I totally invented something brand new. And, and everyone's like, you know, that already exists, right? So I try to be aware, but not so aware that it limits my imagination. If that makes any sense. But getting back to the organization, so there's the four of us that are the core team. We, we talk a lot with Netlify and Prisma, like a lot. Full disclosure, I'm an investor in Netlify, obviously have been since the seed round. I'm an investor in Prisma as well. That was after we started working with them. I love what they're doing, and I think it's, it's going to be a huge improvement in the database integration. So I want to say ORM, but they don't, they don't want to call it an ORM. Query builder, just ORM just captures so much. And the database management side as well. So... We talk with them a ton. It's not a company. It's just an open source project, but I am funding it 
with my own money or through, we have an organization that my wife has spun up called Preston Warner Ventures, which is where we do all of our investing and all of our philanthropic work. So any, any grant, we do a lot of grant making around family planning and we're getting into now a lot of climate change. We do some political activism to try to fix the United States, <laughs> if you will. And so I put money into this, into Redwood where I need to, in order to make it happen. I don't have infinite time. Um, and so where I can make things happen by paying people to do things, then that's a pleasure that I, that I have. And so that's how I'm supporting development on this in the long term. And so that said, I don't have any plans currently to commercialize Redwood, but it's not out of the question that someday there could be a commercial entity around it. I just, I, I just wanted it to exist. And then, and then we'll see where it goes. So you mentioned it's very new software. We got K-Ball grilling you on things that we haven't, haven't quite got to that yet. Slow down, K-Ball. We'll get there. We'll get there. Hey, I was grilling Gatsby last week, and they've had a lot longer to you know, iron true. things out. So, or two weeks ago or whatever. K-Ball, just, he, he grills with impunity. Just whoever comes on, he's going to grill them. What's the best starting place? Or like, is the water warm or is it still frigid? Like, are there, are there be dragons in lots of places? How, I know it's very new because we've been trying to line up the show back in January and you said, hey, let's, let's, let's ship some software first. And that happened just, I believe, Monday as of recording, recording this on March the 12th. Is it like, hop on in, the water's warm, is, it's 0 0.1, but is that super lots of problems or will people have a good experience? grabbing the tutorial and running with it? I think if you go through the, the tutorial, you'll have a great experience. And it's a lot of material there. We go through a lot. I mean, it would take you an hour to do the tutorial, probably. If you went through and you copy-pasted everything in and you, you follow the examples and you look at things a little more deeply, it would take you an hour to go through. So there's, there's a lot there, and it all works for that specific example. But there are a lot of situations where it doesn't like doesn't work great on Windows right now. We haven't really spent a lot of time making it work on Windows, which is why that's the case. But we are still in the make it work phase. The tutorial works, but you know the router does what it needs to do to get the tutorial to work, and all of these things are are really optimized for the tutorial. So. I think you can start playing with it for sure. I would love for people to start playing with it. That's why we wanted to release it so that we could get more real world use cases out there so that that can inform our decisions on what to work on next and see what people really care about. But we don't handle authentication right now. We'll have some really nice authentication plugins. We don't have Storybook integrated right now. And Storybook to me is one of the most exciting things about Redwood. And we, we just, we haven't had a, a chance to in integrate it properly yet because it's a little tricky with things like cells being inside React components. We want to make that work right out of the box where it's super easy to put that into Storybook. It, it'll require some kind of mocking. And we want to we want to solve all that for you. But Storybook fulfills a dream I've had for a really long time, which is I want to be able to work on my components in isolation outside of the application. This is a problem a frustration that I've had with Rails since forever, which is you're like, okay, I'm going to build this you know chunk of the website and I need it to look a certain way. And in order to get it to look like that, I need it to have the right data. And so I'm either going to have to get my database to feed it the data that is going to make it look that way, or I'm going to have to hard code the data in the controller, or maybe I start fiddling with the the view file itself and, and passing it in the data I want and, and it needs to be in these different states, but like these two things would never happen together. So that's not really a valid state. And it just is horrible to try to get the data to look like what you want inside of an application, especially if it's behind authentication, which often it will be. And so the solution to that is to be able to, to separate your rendering logic from your data. And that's exactly what React offers. You say, here's a React component. It takes in these props and it renders this output. As soon as you start using a bunch of global state context, these things get a lot more complicated. Now you have to surround it with a thing that's going to provide that. But it's still, at the end of the day, it's just input. And you can take it out of your application and develop it in isolation. And if you do that, it's amazing because you can just give it whatever data you want at will. You just replace it in the storybook file 
or you have it on a page where you can just type stuff in or you know toggle check marks and get it to look like how you want but it's always consistent because it's always internally managing its its own consistency and you can do it in isolation that way and that to me is a highly underappreciated aspect that react gives you and i think it's because it's hard to do well, especially when you're doing data fetching in your React components, which we think they, they should be co-located because it's super nice. Super nice to be able to do. You're like, here's my data. Here's where I consume my data. Mm-hmm. And, and there you go. You, you'll also have a lot of pure React components that don't need to do that. And those are super easy to test. Mm-hmm. But man, it's nice to be able to develop that way. And at the same time, you're building up your documentation for your design system. You're going to want this stuff anyway. So if you could start there, even even better. So one last big question. So we talked a lot about how to get started playing with Redwood, come to do the tutorial, do things like that. Uh, You invited me saying it's open source and come and contribute. So if I or someone who's listening right now was excited and said, okay, I want to help make this a thing, accomplish all these amazing things that we're talking about here that aren't quite reality, but are within sight, What's the best way to get started as a contributor? So go to redwoodjs.com, and in the upper right, there is a link to our community forum, which is a discourse forum. And you can go in there, and you can ask any questions you want. You can say, hey, I have this idea. I want to, I want to talk about it. We'll engage with you there. If you want to just start writing code, then you can clone down the redwoodjs slash redwood project. There's a contributing document there to help you get spun up to work on Redwood itself and then issue pull requests back or or even just filing issues is super helpful, letting us know what's not working for you in your environment. All of these things are, are totally appreciated and valuable. Awesome. Listeners, you know where to find the links to all things discussed on this episode. That is in your show notes. If you're listening out there outside of a podcast app, we are at changelog.com slash jsparty slash 119 as this is the 119th episode tom thanks so much for joining us i think we i feel like we just kind of touched the the surface here or maybe if it's a redwood analogy we're just kind of (laughs) staring at the bottom of the tree i don't know i'm not sure how that analogy works out but i'm sure we could talk for hours hours more with you but we are hitting up our time thanks so much for joining us and for open sourcing this very cool framework Uh, best of luck and listeners out there give it a shot go through that tutorial I, I can vouch for the for the thoroughness of the tutorial. I try to make it all the way through. I'm like 60% of the way there this morning. So had fun along the way. Uh, that's our show for this week. Divya and Cable, thanks for joining me. Tom, we really appreciate it. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to JS Party. We appreciate you spending time with us. If this show has helped you, entertained you, or brought you joy in any way, please tell a friend. For me, podcasts are a great way to stay connected in times of isolation. Special thanks to Tom Preston Warner for coming on the show and to the Redwood team for hanging out in our Slack chat during the recording. Peter, Rob, and David, y'all are awesome. This episode was hosted by me, Jared Santo, with K-Ball and Divya singing backup. I also produced it, but you probably already knew that. We don't get our beats from Dwight Schrute. Nope, Breakmaster Cylinder hooks us up. And we are brought to you by some amazing sponsors. Please support them. They support the show. Fastly, Linode, and Robar, we can't thank you enough. That's all for now. Except it's not. There's a whole other section after this outro. We'll talk to you next week, or in a few seconds. Your hands, everybody, if you got what it takes. Because I'm Curtis Blow, and I want you to know that these are the breaks. I think it's interesting just pushing the boundaries of, as you mentioned, what the definition of Jamstack is. Because I think we start by saying, like, Jamstack are these particular pieces of technology. It's JavaScript APIs markup. But I think people get caught up because they're like, wait, but my site is just HTML. Is that Jamstack? Wait, my site is server-site rendered. Is that Jamstack? And in a sense, like... From the conversation around it, it is, or that is what people say. So like, for instance, Zeit talks about serverless server-side rendering, which is like Jamstack. I think it's under their definition of what Jamstack is. And so Netlify is like, well, not really. And so there's a lot of conversations back and forth on like, what are the bounds of Jamstack? At what point is it no longer Jamstack? And is it monolithic? Because I think like saying everything is Jamstack kind of dilutes the term slightly, right? Because we want to be like, Not every application should be Jamstack, but Jamstack has huge benefits when it comes to certain types of applications, as you mentioned, 
like marketing pages where you want to pre-render it, you want things to be really fast, and then it makes sense, but not in every situation. And so I think it's just trying to figure out like, what are the bounds of that? And then within Redwood itself, it's like, okay, it's, it's Jamstack, but then there are parts of it that are like, essentially the backend is sort of an external API if you think about it, because it's decoupled from the front end. And so it's just trying to tease those layers apart to explain. Yeah, I think it counts because you've got JavaScript, yeah. statically deliverable JavaScript talking with, with an API to some backend. It just happens with Redwood that you're writing your backend and not using third-party backends. But you very well may be doing a lot of that as well for uploading files, sending emails. You'll still be doing a lot of that kind of thing. And then the markup side, the markup side is like the pre-rendered stuff. So, I, I, but I think there is a clear division between something like Redwood and something like Rails. In oh, the for sure, yeah. Sense. Like Rails is not Jamstack, very much not, right? No. Anything that's doing, to me, anything that's doing server-side rendering is probably not Jamstack. No. Is that controversial? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a hot take. <laughs> that's how I think about it, right? It's about, yeah. it's about pushing everything, being able to push everything to the edge. Mm -hmm. And so right now, I can't quite claim that, that Redwood is like purely Jamstack because of the whole data side of it. But I think that eventually you'll be able to push all those things to the edge with a single Git deploy. And then I think it is. And I think that's a really powerful expansion of what could be considered to be Jamstack. I'm trying to be sensitive to Jamstack. I love it. I, you know, I talked with, with Matt and Chris about this when they were first starting to think about mm -hmm. Jamstack as a name. So I've been, I've been here for the whole ride I'm very sensitive to it, and I did talk to Chris, and he, he seemed to like it. I think mm -hmm. it could be the future of, of what Netlify is capable of doing. Sure, yeah. Break. <laughs> it's like I saw, I saw Jared just wanting to say something. To I break. tried to give you a really nice ending point there, Jared. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but, I really but, liked it. But I actually screwed it up. I know. I'm, I just had to. I was like, I have one more I thing know. I have to build on it. I held my tongue on my one more thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's I always one more thing. Okay. <laughs> that was such a good breaking spot. I might take this <laughs> Jamstack verbiology and either move it to the third segment or and we'll just splice it or maybe put it in the post show. I just honestly, I, I <laughs> wanted someone else to say that because I, I say that a lot. And, and my coworker, Phil Hawksworth as well. Both of us are just like. So serverless server side rendering is not Jamstack. Right? It doesn't uh, make any sense. High five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just like, you're just pushing, you're just making everything Jamstack at that point. And I'm like, dynamically rent. <laughs> because the thing is, the moment you say that, you remove the performance benefits of pre rendering completely. And I'm just like, right. you can't even say it's fast anymore because it's not. Right. And I, I think it's really a product of people's paranoia around SEO, yeah. which I think is. Kind of legitimate, but increasingly less legitimate. Mm -hmm. And especially if you can just do pre-rendering and make it possible to add a little, you know, you sprinkle some JavaScript on top and you can still get what, done what you want to get done while having a pre-rendered site that Google's going to be totally fine with forever. But what if we could just take our server-side rendering, even just go back to the old style Rails app and just take all those Rails apps and just scale them horizontally around the world and to the edges and have this amazing database you guys are talking about that's just kind of persisted around the world and locally available all the time. Isn't that a much more straightforward uh, developer mind flow of like, I get a request, I do some things dynamically and I render the response. If we could solve the problem of it being centrally located and all the things around that, wouldn't that be a better developer? Experience? Yeah, but it doesn't solve the multi-client problem that I think is so prevalent today. If you tightly couple your front end and your back end, then you're not solving the multi-client problem. Mm. That, I think that's exactly the reason. I was 100% on Jared's team until you said that. And I'm like, oh, ah, actually, well, yes. I, I mean, I, I think some of that multi-client problem is kind of the Facebook problem. Like a lot of us just have a website, you know, like a lot of us don't need a CLI or an iPhone app. Well, that's fine. And I think there will be, so there's, you know, you've probably seen Blitz come across your radar. I think that's like, that could be the solution to like, I just need, I'm only going to have a website. I just need it. Like, it's fine to be tightly coupled. It's going to do some magic for me and do transport actually with JSON. But I don't know how you make that multi-client. But if you don't need to, then maybe you don't need the power of Redwood. To me, Redwood is Redwood is a thing that should be scalable. And I don't know how you scale that approach without getting into the multi-client problem. If, if that's not a need that you have, then like that's yeah. Then, then use something else. Like I'm not I'm not trying to make everyone use Redwood. It's just trying to solve a problem that I've seen several times now, and I think a lot of people see. If I've seen it several times, that means that 
a lot of people have seen it. But it comes at a cost, right? There's a cost in complexity. Mm-hmm. So one of We're the things still not on the show, by the way. This isn't the show. <laughs> yeah. All right. We can make it the show. It's now the show. I'll save my thoughts. Because you're just going to keep talking, but I was. I don't care I, I, whether it's the show or not. No, I'm show. having fun, it's but I don't want anybody to have preconceived notions that this is going on to the show because <laughs> this is the break. I had no illusions. Okay. Well, once K-Ball started going on another conversation, I was like, he might be thinking we're back on the show because sometimes we will roll through. <laughs> So I just want to make clear, this is like cutting room floor. That being said, it's so good. We might as well just have like a, a 30 minute post show, which Live is the, Ooh, the yeah. actual show. Just cut it into two shows. Anyways, Kevin, well, do you want to save it for the, sh- um, the show or do you want to? Well, I don't know. I mean, it depends where you want to go. I, 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 I just broke the fourth wall pretty hard. So <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'd love to dig more in the concept of pre-compilation. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I think there's a few different things. So the web is moving more and more in that direction. Like that's a lot of what Jamstack and Gatsby and Svelte are doing is saying like, what is the maximum possible we can compile at build time, do our logic then and push things out. Um, So two things I'd love to explore there. One is the philosophy that you have, which feels like an inversion of the Gatsby approach, right? Gatsby's like pre-compile everything unless you have to not and then have a section that is not. Whereas you're doing the other way, you're saying don't pre-compile unless you have to and then do it. But the other piece is the question of how that relates with multi-client. Like, is there an equivalent to this pre-compile type of thing outside of the web client? I mean, a mobile, a mobile application is essentially pre... Well, it's, it's really no different than delivering your JavaScript client via CDN, right? Like, you're delivering your mobile application as a static thing to a mobile phone and then talking over an API. That's the only way to do it in, with the architecture that that is common today. Yeah, but a, a mobile app delivered that way is more like a spa than a pre-compiled... Yes, you're right. It has nothing to do with the pre-computing thing. Oh, but like, could you do that for mobile mobile application? Is there value in doing that for mobile? Or is there value in doing that for desktop or CLI or something else? Yeah, well, that gets into caching. That's where caching is more appropriate. Like, you would want to do caching at a layer up mm-hmm. before all of your clients Yeah, for performance, if that's what you're going after, which you usually are. Okay, this is all good show content. We need to start the show again. <laughs> start it <laughs> out. You're going to make me, yeah, don't talk, Kate Ball. I'm going to start the show and then start talking. <laughs> In fact, you can take us into the next segment because uh, you're just, you're primed. You've primed the pump. I'm just going to set a marker here and say, go ahead, Kate Ball, start us off. So let's talk a little bit about 